Hello, I'm Renee Worley, Global Voices Metcalf Fellow at International House, here with Jasmine Singer, a well-recognized memoirist, podcast personality, and intersectional activist. Thanks for joining us today, Jasmine. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. Um, so you're a person who does many things very well, uh, from running a nonprofit to co-hosting a podcast with your wife to giving lectures and writing books. You're involved in so many different occupations. So what for you is the unifying force between all of the different media that you work with? Well, thank you. <laughs> and I am very passionate about changing the world for animals. So I think that everything that I do, whether it's with Veg News or with our hen house uh, or with my personal writing or my speaking, centers around how people can embolden themselves to create change for animals. And it is all from a perspective of of overlapping oppressions and recognizing that all of these issues are just a different spoke on the same wheel. Right. Um, so in terms of those overlapping um, oppressions, I guess you've spoken a lot about intersectionality and working with the LGBTQ plus community as well as animal um, activism. So what types of experiences or previous projects have you had that have kind of contributed to your views on intersectionality? Well, I came to the animal rights movement by way of the LGBTQ movement, and specifically AIDS awareness. And I was a longtime vegetarian by then. So I was spending my days working in inner city schools in New York City, basically doing a play and then teaching groups of kids for like a couple months at a time about safer sex, about communication, about AIDS, and uh, then I would go out at night, and I, I wasn't yet a vegan, so I was basically the kind of a vegetarian that existed only on cheese and eggs and pizza. And uh, one day, I met a vegan through that work, and I realized that there was something that I felt didn't comport with my own view of feminism to continue to consume dairy and egg products, given the fact that they are based in the exploitation of female reproductive bodies. So at that point I went vegan and incorporated animal rights activism into my other activism. That's very fascinating. Um, so your spark, like the moment when you realized that um, the oppression of female bodies also applies to non-human animals, that was just through your work in AIDS activism mm -hmm. and sort of what you were eating? That well, that was part of it. it I also met a vegan, as, yeah. as we do. And she showed me a documentary about factory farming. So that was definitely a part of it. And I was a longtime vegetarian by then. I was very passionate about uh, LGBTQ issues. And to me, I started to realize that the mindset of the oppressor is very similar, no matter what group you're marginalizing, what group you're oppressing. So I think that it all came together at that time. Sure. Um so sort of in terms of coming together and realizing those moments for you, um, you've explained in the past that over your course of developing as a vegan as a, and as an activist, that you learned what it means to be truly full. Um, what does that mean for you? I think it's an ongoing journey of constantly committing to lifelong learning and having the humility to question assumptions without that kind of like you know, gotcha effect that a lot of people have toward others. Like, I'm gonna wait for you to mess up and then I'm gonna catch you on it. If there's actual humility brought into the work that we do as activists and as change makers, then we learn to listen a little bit more effectively. So, you know, I think that that's something that really drives me and hopefully uh, keeps, keeps me in check uh, and, and keeps, the point of what I'm doing not centered around myself, but centered around, you know, whatever marginalized community I happen to be advocating for at that moment. Certainly. Um, sort of in terms of your advocacy, uh, your mission statement from Our Hen House, your nonprofit, talks about how the reason for veganism shouldn't be just to eat more compassionately, but also to embrace the future and to look forward to another chapter in our humanity. Um, what do you foresee as an optimistic outlook for our world? Well, I don't think we have, I think an optimistic outlook for the world is to have an outlook for the world because we don't have much of a choice. I mean, aside from animal rights issues, the environmental you know, ramifications of factory farming is going to certainly 
wreak havoc even more so than it already has if we don't change the way we're eating. And as like a social justice activist, part of changing the way I'm eating and my outlook on veganism as a whole is not just what we're consuming in terms of food, but how we're also bringing that same mentality and worldview to how we're treating others. So I guess my optimistic outlook is that, you know, it, it goes back to that quote, which I think is a Samuel Adams quote, which is, it does not take a majority to prevail, rather a irate, tireless minority keen on setting a brush fire in people's minds. And so I think that we have that irate, tireless minority. And I think that, you know, there's some kind of nice synergy going on between animal rights activists who are starting to realize that compassion doesn't begin and end with, you know, non-human animals, but also other social justice warriors who are starting to make the connections to the foods that they eat. Definitely, that's that's a very inspirational answer. I like that as a, as a motivational thing. Um, so sort of, um, you are clearly very active, but your nonprofit also offers, I think, a hundred different ways that people can get involved in working with your movement. Um, are there any of those methods that really resonate for you or like a past project or moment that you can reflect on? Well, I'm doing it. I mean, I think that the point is that everyone needs to bring their skills and their talents and their interests to their activism, and their activism needs to be centered around their, their skills and their interests and their talents. So, you know, for me, I like to make media. So I wound up not only co-founding our hen house, but also heading up editorial at Veg News Magazine. But for somebody else, it might be academia, and it might be like getting, getting classrooms to cover animal rights issues or other intersectional issues. So you know, for me, it's definitely media making, and I also strongly believe in the power of personal narrative. Hence, you know, having a memoir, and I think that the animal rights movement has really underutilized memoir as, and personal narrative as a means to creating social change. And I hope that more and more people continue to find their voice and share their story, because that, I think, is how we will move the needle forward. Definitely. Um, kind of on the subject of your memoir, in a TED talk you gave, you talked about the role of compassion, both for oneself and for other people. But you also brought up the idea of authentic identity and being something grounding for developing compassion. Can you talk more about that? I think that you know it took me a long time to get to this place, but I realized kind of the hard way that we can't actually fully embrace our activist self unless first we're practicing both self-care and collective care. And collective care is something that is a term that I first heard by Patrice Cullors, who's one of the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and it basically is like, how can we create safe spaces and foster safe spaces? So that's something that was missing for me personally for a long time when I was just like working 24 seven for the animals to the point where I was neglecting my own animal rights. So I think that once we let go of allowing ourselves to be you know so removed from our own bodily integrity as we fight for the bodily integrity of others then we can actually more effectively create change uh, i also think that uh, we need to you know support each other so that we're not in this by by ourselves and and i guess that's where self-compassion comes in to me it, it is the key to embracing our identity ultimately um, so I guess the journey toward embracing our own identity is definitely a rocky one for everybody, but is there, um, were there any unexpected hurdles or obstacles that you faced in that journey that you can share a little bit about in terms of overcoming them? Well, I was a bullied kid when I was growing up, and I think that ultimately, even though I wish it hadn't happened, I think ultimately it was, you know, it wound up being the most important factor of my adult activism. Um, but I was also like, you know, I wound up losing a lot of weight in my early 30s and the world started treating me very differently at that time. And so what wound up happening is that I started to realize that how I had jumped the fence from being someone who the world had so, you know, arbitrarily disregarded to someone that the world was accepting and even sometimes celebrating. I think that was a really difficult moment for me and that's a big subject in my book because 
you know, it, it made me really question the authenticity of others. And ultimately, just kind of hearkening back to your other question, like that made me realize that the opinions and perception of others is ultimately pretty unimportant in terms of how my perception of myself should inform the way I show up in the world. Definitely. Um, if someone watching this interview um, has had a similar recollection, or not recollection, but a similar um, revelation about their identity, would you have any words for them or recommendations for what they can do to um, sort of realize their own identity? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a gigantic, huge, enormous <laughs> question. <laughs> but um, I, I think that one thing that I find very empowering is to realize that like in this world where I don't have a whole lot of control over a lot of things, I have control over what I'm consuming. And so I would say for me, the process of like embracing my identity ultimately started with like questioning where my money was going and what, you know, like what I was supporting and if it was in alignment with my ethical beliefs. Once that more or less fell into alignment, I, you know, then started to question whether I was addressing boundaries with, with myself and, and, you know, basically if I was taking care of myself. And I wasn't. And I think a lot of activists don't. I think a lot of students don't. I think a lot of service providers and caregivers don't. Uh, so I think we cannot absolutely cannot access the road to our personal identity and authenticity unless we are actively and radically practicing self-care. So it has to start with like just the very basics. And you know, it can be really easy to just not get enough sleep because we have so much to do, but it literally needs to start with those very basic forms of self-care. Otherwise, we will not be able to be activists for anybody else. Definitely. I think that's a wonderful message for anyone to take away. Um, is there anything else to you that you would like to communicate to our audience today? I, I believe strongly in the power of creative expression, and I think that it not only helps with uh, ultimately being better activists and allies, but I think that it is a really great way of taking care of like these instinctual urges that we often have as kids and then we just get too busy. So I think that everyone should have some kind of a creative outlet and within the scope of a creative outlet, like a safe space. So if we're like living among people who don't get us and we don't really have a choice, where a lot of people under 25 wouldn't necessarily have a choice in the matter of where they're living. Certainly, you know, teenagers wouldn't have much of a choice. I think that we still can find groundedness through creative expression and through making sure that we are seeking out those safe spaces in whatever form we can. So I guess, you know, that's something that I wish I had realized earlier on. Definitely. Um, that's all wonderful advice and great reflections for thank you, you. Uh, I'd like to thank you again for joining us for this interview. Um, we really appreciate your presence and look forward to hearing what you have to say later. I'm excited. Thank you. Thank you.